what if there's a COVID relief act that doesn't have all that much to do with COVID relief? And what if there's a so-called For the People Act that's at odds with the principles of American democracy? And uh, what do you do when you can't buy your grandkids the books that used to be your own kids' favorite books, or when those books now come with the equivalent of a cancer warning? We'll talk about all this and more on today's Independent Outlook. Welcome, everybody. I'm Graham Walker, coming to you from the Independent Institute here in Oakland, California. We're just a stone's throw from San Francisco. Uh, we try to give you an independent perspective, an independent outlook on the events of the day. Uh, let me also welcome my great colleagues for this ongoing conversation. First of all, uh, David Thoreau, who is the founder and president of Independent Institute. Welcome, David. Hello. So glad to have you with us. As always, he brings uh, a long memory of public policy uh, work and expertise. Uh, also with me today is my colleague, Dr. Williamson Evers, who is the director of our Center on Educational Excellence. Welcome, Bill. Thank you. So glad you're both with us today. Uh, so glad also that we have our friends with us, our partners in this project at thinkspot.com. Uh, and of course, also many people are joining us for this today through our YouTube channel, our Facebook page, our Twitter uh, feed, and so forth. Uh, welcome to everybody around the country and beyond for this conversation. So uh, let's get started today. Um, <clears throat> first of all, I mean, I don't know if it's fair or unfair of me to say that the COVID Relief Act, Relief Act, which was just passed by the House after having been passed by the Senate and which President Biden promises to sign into law on Friday, was it fair of me to say that it's a, it's a COVID Relief Act that doesn't have that much to do with COVID? Or was I exaggerating, David? Yeah, I think that's fair. It's basically a measure to um, pay off constituents um, of the Democratic Party, uh, also to bail out um, the harmful effects of their policies on the state and local level. Um, it's a bailout, it's a, it's a payback to the teachers unions mm -hmm. uh, and you now the, the whole list, um, regardless of how it, what it portends as far as debt for future generations, um, misallocating resources in uh, s significant ways. So it's it's predictable, but it's negative. I was, Bill, go ahead. It's just interesting that the front page of today's Los Angeles Times says that liberals are embracing the conservatives' charge that this is a liberal wish list. <laughs> That's pretty fascinating. Yeah. What, what things appeal to the progressives most, do you think, and irk the conservatives the most? I think the thing about not allowing the states to cut taxes are the yeah. thing that probably fascinates the progressives the most and probably irritates conservatives and libertarians the most. Here's what I'm just reading a bit verbatim from the bill. Uh, it, it says um, that the states receiving this money uh, shall not use the funds provided to either directly or indirectly offset a reduction in the net tax revenue, <clears throat> nor can they do anything that reduces any tax by providing for a reduction in a rate, a rebate, a deduction, a credit, or otherwise, or delays the imposition of any tax or tax increase. And apparently, Miss Mississippi, New Hampshire, and West Virginia were already planning tax cuts, yes. and it may be that they won't even be able to do what they already plan to do, much less stopping anybody else. Well, I'm just wondering how much of this is is fungible. It's the same argument that the Democrats were using as far as uh, restrictions that the, that the Republicans put in the Senate version of the bill uh, as far as how some of the funding is used. So, uh, you know, the courts will have to look at it. But I think it's pretty uh, a cynical measure that Schumer got that in there uh, and Pelosi, uh, basically saying that the public is captive and you know that's just the way it is and we're in charge and we're gonna make the rules and you have to comply and that's it. I understand that there are $350 billion earmarked for state governments and Native American tribes, <clears throat> which apparently exceeds the actual budget shortfalls of uh, those groups, those states. But they can't, <laughs> but they can't use any excess <clears throat> to help out the taxpayers. They have to somehow either bank it or spend it. And hey, what better way to go ahead than to spend money uh, at somebody else's expense? It, it's not uncommon for a program that comes in where there's 
other states level spending for a federal program to say you have to hold on to your previous program, your previous expenditures. Not sure I really like it that much, but it's certainly not uncommon. I think this thing with taxes is a rather new, newfangled thing, and I think David's right. The courts are going to have to look at it pretty carefully. Somebody got creative on this thing with you can't reduce taxes. Sometimes people in Washington, D.C. being creative is not quite as good a thing as people in the private enterprise being creative. Isn't that true? <clears throat> Absolutely. Uh, tell us about some of the other features in this bill that uh, our friends need to know about, David or Bill. Well, there's a, a measure earmarked 1.5 million for the Seaway International Bridge between New York and Canada. A Schumer pet project. Uh, ah, naturally. A Schumer yeah. pet project. Uh, there's 50 million for family planning. Uh, going to Wait, what's that got to do with COVID relief? Exactly going to Planned Parenthood primarily. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, you've got uh, FEMA and uh, the Wall Street Journal estimated that of the 1.9 trillion, 825 billion is directly related to COVID relief. I think that's way too high. And 1 trillion for expansion of as they put it, quote, expansions of progressive programs, pork, and related policy changes, which I think is too generous, quite frankly. Mm. Oh, so one other feature of it that struck me as particularly egregious is, let's take a state that's been relatively open and has had certain amount of employment, certain amount of economic activity, jobs, so forth. How about Texas? And then take some other state that's closed everything down very rigidly, had a very severe lockdown. So the, <laughs> the aid goes to the state that has had the severe lockdown. Yep. And not even if they had the same death rate or something like that, they they the one that did the more stringent, more suppressive, more oppressive form of uh, handling this public health matter gets more money. It's a subsidy <laughs> to being a tyrant. It's called the blue state bailouts. Mm -hmm. Well, it's probably not a bad way to put it. Right. So the blue state bailouts, uh, the... Uh, uh, there's 39.6 billion going to higher education. And many of these schools are not even open or they're distance learning and so forth. Mm -hmm. This education of course, many thing. Of these, many of these schools have massive endowments. So this is not exactly for the low income uh, disadvantaged person. Um, and you know, it's the way most of these progressive policies end up is they essentially are rewarding elites uh, with the cover that it's helping the uh, the average person or the person who is disadvantaged. So another strange feature of it, continuing in education, but this time to co K-12, is that this is supposed to be a COVID emergency bill, but much of the K-12 money can't be used until after this calendar year, after 2021. That's right. So it's just a place they've snuck subsidies in. And yeah. uh, it's not a COVID relief bill. It's just a Christmas tree. All right. So mo most of the, a lot of the measure actually goes through, the measure funding goes through uh, 2023. Um, San Francisco's projected annual, I guess it's a two-year budget deficit is $650 million. That's completely covered now. Uh, and New York's bailout uh, will be covered. Hmm. Uh, oh, that's right. Schumer is from New York. I forget. I think he is from New York, come yeah. to think of it. So it, it's pretty blatant. And uh, I think the average person is going to see through a lot of it. Uh, they're not going to see much of any improvement, even when they get the check. Right. If they get a check, because that will be temporary. Uh, fortunately, the uh, measure to, to increase the uh, minimum wage is not again included because yes. of the, the parliamentarian ruled against it. 
and mm-hmm. some of the on the cusp Democrats didn't want it either. Yeah. Right. Exactly. And a, another California boondoggle is a subway in San Jose. Right. <laughs> right. This I've is driven sub- through. I've driven to downtown San Jose a million times. What? A, what a, they don't need what a are subway. They talking about? <clears throat> yeah. Right. As, as if Silicon Valley needs funding. And of course, getting back to your point, Bill, is the uh, the the blue state bailout basically yeah. means these blue states are mismanaged. All right. And those states that are well managed, the people who worked hard and actually made wealth and improved people's lives are going to be They're penalized penalized. to subsidize the blue state bailout. Not everybody, you know, is a news hound like the three of us are. So among ordinary people, a uh, conversation often, you know, is pretty more straightforward. So do you think that getting fourteen hundred dollars, you know, is a good idea or not a good idea? <clears throat> you know, and most people say, well, it's probably a good idea. It would help me out or, or people who are below seventy five thousand a year. Yeah. You know, give them fourteen hundred dollars. <clears throat> so you're in favor of the bill then. <clears throat> that, that's kind of the the, the pop public is seeing that little one slice of it. Now, that slice is is bad enough. But um, people making seventy five thousand, an individual making seventy five thousand, or a couple making one hundred fifty thousand, are not poor. No, they're not poor. So what's the point? The point is they're basically buying votes and they're trying to buy mm-hmm. constituents that, uh, you know, a chicken in every pot kind of a thing. By focusing and, the interest on the the payments to individuals or couples, <laughs> families, um, it's a kind of distraction though from all the rest of the spending in the exactly. bill. Exactly. Like, right. I don't like this part of the bill, you know, the 1400 or whatever. But if that were all it was, it would be way less damaging than, in fact, it is. Yeah. One other measure that uh, got pulled back was uh, the, the earlier bill wanted to provide $400 weekly bonus through August 29th, and that was reduced. This is unemployment benefit. Unemployment, yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, this was reduced to 300 until September 6th. So that marginal difference will results in more people working. Yes, but all unemployment payments have a tendency yes. to divert people from the job search That's and right. Especially them coming from going back pandemic. to work as soon as they c- truly could. So uh, while we, we want to care about the tough situation that some people are in, we just have to think of what the consequences of this sort of policy is going to be. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Um, maybe we should mention um, a little bit more about the money going to schools. I forget what the total amount was, but uh, Bill, you're an expert on the school reopening stuff. Uh, uh, did you notice how much money is supposed to be going to schools to help them reopen? Yeah, it's going to be $129 billion. Right. $129 billion. I mean, a billion here, a billion there. Pretty soon you're talking real money. Yes, as Everett Dirksen used to always say, <laughs> it's it's a uh, and that's Public for K through Illinois. That's K through twelve schools, and then that's on K top of 12. that is the higher education. Right, right. Too. right. So, how's this uh, reopening going? Let's say here in California, Bill. It's a complicated thing because we have people talking about this at the national level. We have governors talking about it, state public health officials, obviously national public health officials, and we have local school boards. The real decisions are, at least in California, are ending up being made by the local school boards. And the governor has his idea. He's got a huge pack of paperwork that the school districts are supposed to go through. But essentially, he's leaving it to the discretion of the union and the Mm -hmm. local district. Mm -hmm. And, you know, he caused this shutdown. He could just zip in into reverse. I don't really like doing things back and forth by executive degree at high levels of government. I mean, on one level, it's not so bad to have it done at the local level. It's just the power of the teachers unions and the way they've behaved so execrably in this uh, crisis is rather disconcerting. Uh, We have a so, so the governor has these goals of when he's going to get people back to school next month, right? And it looked like Los Angeles was going to be the fly in the ointment there. The unions mm-hmm. there particularly They were holding aggressive. out, right? 
Uh, do you want me to go into the Los Angeles situation a bit? Well, yeah, go there. Yeah, tell us okay. some of those. The details are fascinating. So <laughs> it's very peculiar. We have all these different reopening so-called happening like there's one in cleveland that just just got decided after lots of jumping up and down and showing off and whatever cleveland ohio but it turns out they're not really going back they're really going back to hybrid <laughs> so that means they have like a couple days in school and three days at home over the zoom well los angeles is kind of the same i mean they're <laughs> They're going to have the kids are going to be in classes, but the teachers are going to teach them over Zoom in the classroom. And so they're not actually going to have for, for the middle schools. The elementary schools might have in-person teaching, but the middle schools and the high schools in Los Angeles, which is the second biggest school district in the country. So these public schools are not going to have in-person teaching. So. Is it really right to call it reopening of the schools when the teachers are not there in the classroom? There is, I mean, people have envisioned in the past teaching everything through movies, teaching everything through the radio, teaching everything. There's a reason, there's a, a, a kind of moral theater to the classroom. There's a kind of in-person chemistry that's there in the classroom. And yes, it's expensive to, to do things in person, but it works better, at least so far. And maybe we're going to eventually Well, it's because get... human beings aren't microchips. Well, I, I'm not saying that no one will ever figure out how to make online learning as effective as in person, but they haven't yet. And so... Right. We need the kids back in the classroom and we need the teachers to be there in person. They can read the audience. They can mm -hmm. hear, they can see whether the kid is looking at his iPhone under the desk or <laughs> is paying attention. Mm -hmm. It's just part of getting focus for the kids is to have someone overseeing them. And this thing in Los Angeles, it's, it's, it's a travesty and, and it's a tragedy for these the lost learning that these children are having. I wonder if maybe <clears throat> this period of shutdown of the schools may end up providing some data that reinforces the concern or the value of in-person learning because we're going to see what happens when you don't have much in-person learning. It's the kind of experiment that would probably go afoul of normal ethical uh, you know, testing requirements since you're using human beings as the, the lab uh, objects, as it were. But it's very possible that, that your point about in-person learning is going to be vastly vindicated by the outcomes or the depressed outcomes of students during this period. I, I think so. But I just want to warn you that they're, <laughs> they've already thought of that. They've suspended testing. <laughs> oh, man. So they don't have, so what does standardized testing mean? It means that the testing is objective and that it's given under standard conditions. Mm -hmm. So every kid is supposed to be in a similar situation who's taking the test. And, you know, different districts are probably going to have placement tests. At least I hope they will. Mm -hmm. But they're not really necessarily paying attention to standardized conditions and the test being the same as the neighboring school district is using and so forth. So eventually some sophisticated status, you know, statistician and test expert is, are going to figure out how to measure the lost learning and, and so forth. They will eventually go back to testing and we will know, but you know, in the meantime, these children, it, it's going to hurt their future income. Mm. It's going to hurt their future schooling. Yeah. It's going to hurt their psychological disposition. I mean, I, I want to say, despite everybody saying all the horrible things about children's mental health, a lot of children are very resilient. But thank goodness, this is still nothing that we want to impose on them. Right. Um, you know, I want to come back to the schools question in a minute, but we are getting some interesting questions from our participants uh, in different locations, many through ThinkSpot. Um, just coming back to the $1.9 trillion in itself, um, since 
I, I'll contextualize this question I just got, but the context is, you know, it's not as if we had $1.9 trillion of tax revenue sitting around languishing. <clears throat> uh, this is going to be borrowed. <clears throat> uh, and so questioner asks, what's the probability of inflation or hyperinflation with all this money printing? David, are you in a position to talk about that a little bit? Well, one thing that we should realize is that about a trillion of past bills has yet to be spent. So we're just flooding the society with printed money. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you have something like zero interest rates, uh, which we were approaching for a while, of the funds. Yeah, because mm -hmm. the there's price gonna of be, money. There's going to be a lot of that misallocation because people don't are not going to think of it as an investment. It's just sort yeah. of free money. It's free money, and there's no accountability. So the, the Fed is online is in, is in sync yeah. to essentially uh, continue this right. easing quantitative easing measure. Uh, it's too bad that Judy Shelton did not get appointed to the Fed. Right. Uh, she, would have, she would have raised she questions. She would have been a warming, the warning bell. Yes. Right. The Fed doesn't want to be questioned. So I think it's fair to say if you've been watching the business sections of the major metropolitan newspapers over the last, well, they, they run up to the election and then during the election and then now that Biden's in office, that they talk about inflation and the potential for inflation is going up on a curve like this. It, That's right. it didn't used to be in the papers at all because yes. we didn't have any inflation. We've kind of forgotten what it's like, but David, is hyperinflation a possibility? I think it is a possibility. And the, the, the idea that we're going down the same kind of path of Venezuela and other countries is disturbing. But progressives, they, they don't care. They, all they care about is their, their woke ideology and catering to the interest groups that give them power to impose it. I want to, I want to get back a tiny bit to the school reopenings thing. Uh, Biden is also a player in this, not just yep. Newsom, not just the local teachers unions. So Biden's plan is he insists on six feet apart, even though the CDC, various top medical authorities say three feet apart is perfectly reasonable. And he also, Biden also has some sort of strange thing about the same as we also have in California about levels of cases and on and on that will actually end up delaying. The, the level of cases is not really that important when it comes to children because children either don't get it or they get a mild case. Right. And so the community caseload is not important for schools. And the, the schools, the, the kids under 16 should have been in school the whole time. The kids over 16 should have been in school with some attention paid to mitigation, like the three feet, like masks. And the rest of this is just a strike by the teachers to get more fun stuff in their classrooms, and get more money. Well, it's not I just- I really think so. And, and, and by the way, Kennedy, the personality on television, I thought had a, a pretty good statement. She said, she said, uh, oh, where is that fun quote? I will have it in a moment. Here we go. She said, keeping children out of school for, while not working, but collecting a full paycheck is clearly the end game for a group of wholly expendable educators who need to be fired en masse for committing this level of fraud. Wow, so that was pretty. It might, it might be a little over the top, but it's pretty. It cuts pretty close to the truth. I think that the average parent is beginning to view that, feel it the that situation way, right? that way. Right. One thing also is this: is that studies show that the school closures are disproportionately affecting minorities, yes, uh, and poor children. Um, and in addition, the cases among for example, Latino residents has dropped from a high of 2,400 per 100,000 in January to about 453 as of February. Black residents uh, had nearly 234 per 100,000 residents. That's dropped dropped to there. Asian and white residents, the same kind of uh, enormous drop. So the risk to 
the teachers is dropping. And we know that the, as you mentioned, Bill, that the children don't get it and the children don't pass it. Right. The, the teachers can get it from other adults. Uh, but, you know, if, if, the, uh, if the teachers want to get vaccinated or, or take the precautions you mentioned, that's fine. But the, the very fact that they are forcing people whose children are being uh, disproportionately harmed uh, as far as education, as far as health and so on, is a tragedy. And the teachers do not need to be vaccinated. It's a disgrace. Innumerable health authorities, including the yep. CDC, have said so. But in California, we now have special teacher priorities. Yep. In Los Angeles, they've said we don't want to go back until we're all vaccinated. And it's, you know, it's just a holdup. I think part of what we're also seeing and looking at this in a little bigger way is, is uh, the polls show that the people who believe in the pandemic extreme position uh, tend to be, they lean progressive. And those that want to open up the economies, they don't buy a lot of the scare tactics, tend to be more conservative. And so we're also subsidizing uh, this woke ideology. We're, we're subsidizing extreme risk sensitivity. Right, exactly. Yeah, that's what we're subsidizing. Extreme right. risk aversion, mm -hmm. and which is not based, you know, they claim it's on the science, based on the science, and it's simply not. It reminds me of some of our previous conversations where um, it, we pointed out that uh, the Great Barrington Declaration, which had been signed by, what, <clears throat> hundreds and hundreds uh, of, of scientists thousands. argued, thousands, thousands now, thousands by now, right. yeah, argued that there should have been and should yet be focused protection rather than comprehensive lockdown. I think the numbers are something like uh, 15 to 17,000 scientists have signed it and something in the neighborhood of 40,000 health professionals have signed it. Right. And no one has refuted it. I mean, right. the, you know, the data supports it. In fact, the data supports it better now than, than when, they, when they drafted it. I think we need to go to HR1 because that could just ruin our, <laughs> our whole okay. constitutional republic. Okay, got it. Now, HR1 has not yet become law. Thank unlike goodness. the so-called COVID relief. Act. Unlike the so-called COVID relief act. Right. Fortunately, there's more opposition to it. Yeah, yeah. It's it's going to have a harder time passing for sure, and it 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 should have a harder time passing. It's called the For the People Act, and from what I've read about it, not having read the text of the bill itself, to to be honest, but my impression is that it's essentially about broadening uh, voting and making it easier and easier for people to vote which on the surface sounds kind of good, except that it seems that it opens all sorts of doors for people to vote who really are not entitled to vote. Um, and that worries me. Some people refer to it as for the Swamp Act. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And, and it basically is nationalizing elections based on the model that uh, signature verification, vo vo voter IDs, any sort of authentica authentication of who is voting and they, are they doing it in a, a legal and honest way cannot be substantiated. So it's, it's, it's essentially legalizing voter fraud. So it, it, mandates, in, it, it mandates permitting of ballot harvesting. Yes. So that's... Okay, a quick uh, definition. Ballot harvesting is... Okay. It means that a third person can go out and pick up your ballot and turn it in for you mm -hmm. and, or can have a box somewhere that you put it in uh, instead of you either going through the mail or going in person to a, a ballot. Uh, can the ballot person. harvester sort of check and make sure the voter didn't make any mistakes on his ballot? Well, that wouldn't be what the idea supposedly is, but I don't, I don't see... I mean, <laughs> I can imagine a devilish individual doing a number of things like I'm a Democrat and I just picked up this ballot from this Republican uh, and gee, I lost it. <laughs> well, know, it's just open to the most outrageous things. Or vice versa. I, oh, of course. Uh, absolutely, of course. And, and there are there are dominant Republican states where people have done this also. So it's not. 
unique to one thing. So another thing is that it 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 reduces free speech. Uh, you know, ACLU lawyers have criticized it for doing that. It interferes with that. It imposes a code of ethics on the U.S. Supreme Court. I don't exactly know what that has to do with, uh, you know, voting, but that's certainly not good. It makes Election Day a public holiday. So, I mean, that interferes with business and businesses' activities. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, Election Day, there is no thing as Election Day anymore. It's Election Weeks. Right. Well, election uh, weeks. Let's make it Election Plural. Month. <laughs> right. mm -hmm. Exactly. Uh, it, it wants to govern from a federal level redistricting commissions. That's mm -hmm. really not a, 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 something that's constitutional or in accord with federalism. And so they're just, they just stuck everything they possibly could. They want to roll back Citizens United, which allowed for uh, donations of a certain sort to go through without being stopped or scrutinized. And, uh, you know, it's just an action of freedom of speech and freedom of assembly and freedom of trying to influence elections. And I, you know, I mean, I, I'm not really even that much in favor of disclosure, but, but what they want is they want to control elections from the federal level. They want to control election spending. They want to control the judiciary <laughs> scrutiny of this. And they want to make sure their people can vote in droves and everybody else is restricted. I think that's how it sums up to me. It also creates federal funding of elections. Yes. Big subsidies. Exactly. Subsidies. And so it's basically... So not uh, just funding of the election process, yes. but funding of the candidates. Right, exactly. And uh, one of the, another twist to the story here, uh, you know, if you go back to the history of progressivism, it has a very questionable history. Um, uh, ra a racist history, pro-eugenics, pro-war, etc. And one of the issues um, for blacks, for example, was that uh, anti-black anti groups would, in, in the early days, uh, claim that they were handling the voting uh, for blacks, uh, and they would gather the votes or just ignore it and just, you know, vote on, on mass for that, this different group in this county. And so progressives essentially embraced the same policy. Yeah, they're basically saying that we're going to control the process, and uh, we can't be accountable for what happens. Another thing is that it expands. This bill would expand who is a lobbyist. So people who comment on, our, you know, let's say Independent Institute, you know, comments on some measure. That's yep. <laughs> are we now a lobbyist? Yep. You know, it, this is not a joke. This is something that we might we might easily face. I mean. We do even now face to some extent, but this would, it, it's just, it's a big attack. Not on the healthy for a constitutional Republic to have right. this so kind of. So it's a big attack on first amendment. Yes. Rights. And, uh, but clearly the Democrats have had this already uh, done. Right. Their... This measure has been floating around right. in various inchoate forms yes. for a while. They've, pass it in previous democratic things, or most of it. Mm -hmm. And it's, anyway, so there it is. There are problems with this sort of from a philosophical point of view. First of all, constitutionally, we've already indicated the part that troubles me is the idea that the national government, <clears throat> if you want to call it the federal government, the central government, is now going to mandate <clears throat> and dictate to the states and communities how elections shall be conducted. <clears throat> that seems highly problematic to me from the point of view of constitutional order. Uh, it's a federalism concern. <clears throat> but secondly, um, David's illustration from the Jim Crow era is very uh, apt <clears throat> because the rationale given at the time was that uh, uh, African-American voters needed help Right. Uh, to, to to do their balloting and so forth. So now, you know, that was obviously an egregious claim um, and discriminatory. But as you were suggesting a moment ago, David, uh, the idea that people really can't uh, figure things out and they need to have these ballot harvesters to help them yeah. seems remarkably and similar. And they can't bring their driver's license <laughs> or some substitute to the bowl. Right. So, you, so to get your to get your check from the COVID-19 bill, 
You have yeah. to have ID. To, to get your shot. To get your shot. I mean, anything. To go to the Democratic Party convention, you had to have an ID. But not to vote under right. this bill. And so it's basically patronizing and it's, it's, it's basically setting up a system that is open from fraud with no way to check. As Charles Kessler said in the editorial in the current issue of Claremont Review, Claremont Review of Books, he said there's sort of two attitudes toward voting. The Republicans and conservatives and libertarians say, well, you know, an individual should go in, in person, if possible, think, you know, make up their mind and vote. Okay, so the Democrats say, well, we just need to do this so we can facilitate the various voting blocks having their maximum input. The LGBTQ block, the black block, the Latino block, whatever it is block, if you do anything that slows that block down, <laughs> then you're a racist and some other appropriate thing. So, at the level of that's, at the level of an insight that's what's at the going level of here. principle, I don't see anything wrong. In fact, I see much right with the idea that voting is a highly responsible act and that it requires conscientious engagement on the part of the voter to do so. Uh, in other words, if you have to work that day, you go early or you go late. Um, you care about voting. You inform yourself about voting. You have to take steps to make sure you're registered to vote. You have to be able to keep track of your identity to demonstrate it. All those things make voting a responsible act of citizenship as opposed to just a knockoff, you know, throwaway thing that you do when you feel like it or somebody tells you to do. Raising the bar of conscientiousness for voting seems to me to be a principle of constitutional citizenship. It HR is, but, one. but you have to understand that uh, the people who are behind this, many of them believe, uh, don't really believe in individual agency itself. Right. They exactly. believe that people's views are determined uh, and the culture is misleading them and mm -hmm. you know, whatever. And there's a whole thing. We can talk about that uh, later. Those who know better need to act education, on... Mm -hmm. Education. But I think that fundamentally this overarching philosophy this collectivist view is that you can't depend on individual agency. It doesn't really exist. And we need to be in charge to make sure people make the right decisions or we're going to uh, stack the deck or mark the cards so that we win the, the, the hand each time it's dealt. Yeah, it's troubling because what it means in effect is that if human beings don't have or are not really capable of conscientiously uh, controlling their own decision making, but are, you know, f driven this way or that by their identity or their experiences or whatever, right. then experts need to come in on their behalf and facilitate them, which means right. that the progressive. Do we think that Merritt Garland might slow some of this down? Oh, there's a good question. He just got confirmed as attorney general. So the one thing I worry about him is his horrible experience being there in the aftermath of the Oakland City bombing and his carrying from that that there are right-wing crazies everywhere and that he has to be, you know, engaged in expanding of state power in order to combat these. Uh, well, there are a few right-wing crazies are some, out there. I, I, mm -hmm. We all know that there are some. Uh, yeah, all of crazies. our listeners know. There, but, there's, there's no question about it. But, I mean, he has not been... Uh, articulate anyway about Antifa or Black Lives Matter violence. Right. He's apologized for it yeah. uh, in, so, in certain respects. Um, but I do think that his saying that uh, the DOJ under his direction is not going to be uh, manipulated by the White House and by Congress. Now, you can take that two ways. Yeah. Uh, you can take it to say that there's a certain standard of integrity that he's going to insist on. That's what but we you can hope also, for. Right. But you can also say, but the deep state has not shown right. that it, we can be we can put trust in it. And they might they might be worse than the White House. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Well, the White House itself really has no direction except the handlers who are behind really making the decisions. Biden is not making any decisions and Harris will go with whatever the flow is. Ah, so, but Biden did do something very important. He left off 
Dr. Seuss from Read Around America. Right. That was important. <laughs> Very yeah. important. Right. And again, this, this woke ideology, uh, this patronizing censorship ideology that we see in big tech and schools and all the rest of it, again, is justified uh, by, by progressives or advocates uh, because people can't be trusted. Mm -hmm. they, uh, they don't have the agency, they don't have the schooling, they don't have the um, gender, race, whatever identity that would keep them on the right track. Mm -hmm. And so let's their own, allow them to watch Peter Pan, yes. Dumbo, right. on yeah. and on, yes. uh, Pepe Le Pew. Right. And, and, and the stupid thing about it is the people who make that argument exempt themselves from their own collectivist view. They have the video themselves. <laughs> well, they, them, they themselves have agency. It's just that nobody else does. Mm -hmm. In my own area of education, this whole thing has carried over in a rather horrifying way to the idea that mathematics is racist. Yes. And uh, so in Oregon, the state of Oregon, promoted a uh, promoted a thing called pathway to math equity. Oh, I can hardly wait to find out about the pathway. Well, basically math is racist. That's the summary. You could just but but let's say you're a person that wants to rectify that. So so here are some things to do. First of all, this is the most mild one. Uh, no individual effort. Uh, it's all group work. Yes. Okay. So, by the way, there's group work and group work. If you have, let's say you set up in your school competitive teams, the reds and the blues or something, and you work on math projects, but you also make sure you have tests of various sorts that see if the individual kid is learning. This is actually a great idea, but that's not what this is talking about. They're just talking about cooperative learning, group learning. Okay, so that's the most mild thing. Uh, no tracking. So tracking is individual ability groupings in math, but, but the research shows that the more tracks you have, the better all levels of kids are doing. Okay, and it's also simpler for the teacher. Uh, no showing of work. Right. If you're doing a math problem, you show how you do the long division or something like that. If they even allow long division, that's another whole story. But no showing of your work. Okay, that would be racist to show your work and have the teacher evaluate. Oh, no, another thing. Grading should not be based on not, no, the kid demonstrating knowledge acquired. Okay? Yeah. It should be maybe effort or I don't know what, but it's not supposed to be based on attainment of knowledge. That would be racist. Uh, and, and so they, their, their underlying claim is mathematics has been shown to uphold racism and capitalism, okay? <laughs> so this is the argument that we can't try and effectively do things like get the right answer. This is not unique to these people. We've had previous episodes in yeah, we know, we math know. instruction where people hate the idea of striving to get the right answer, but they brought it up now under a new guise. It's racist to want the kids get the right answer. Bill, do this, you have to, Bill, do this you is have a to... terrible thing for these underprivileged kids to be taught this way because they will never successfully use math in their lives if they're given math of this sort. That's right. Bill, do you have that's a quote from uh one of the key people behind this about objectivity doesn't exist. Yeah, well, that's, you know, the, the postmodernist ideas and things like this are also playing their part in this. Right. It's this postmodernism seeping into all these different, into the sciences, into, you know, it's been in the humanities. Uh, right. Mathematics is a language. Uh, one of the interesting things about mathematics is, is that virtually every aspect of mathematics developed through reason without empirical study. It was only later that people no, found that- it's a mixture. No, let me I mean, finish, they're Bill. trying to figure out the fields after the Nile, uh, you know, inundated them. It's, yeah, that's it's right. But mixture. the point is that they mathematical- They build the pyramids. Mathematical concepts in almost every field developed through reason 
and then yeah. they realized there was an application to it. So oh. it, it really sort of is, it, I think in some respects, it reinforces Plato's view of ideas. Mm. And I am going to be with Aristotle against Plato, but this is what debates are made of. <laughs> right. No, <laughs> let's hear Plato. Case, Go on, point, on Plato. <laughs> my point is that this is an attack on objective reality. Yes. And that uh, the outcome of this is that the purpose of math has nothing to do with accomplishing things and learning uh, the precisions of how the world is put together and cause and effect. So engineering is thrown out, science is thrown out, and so on. So it's really an attack on education itself. Um, and the fact that this is in a lot of education schools and uh, is being pushed by- It's a horrible thing. So, so they, they advocate, instead of showing your work, make a TikTok video. Yes, that's right. Yep. <laughs> Come on, while we're writing it down so the teacher can look at what you've written down. Just to be clear, the stuff that uh, Bill Evers was citing a moment ago was actually official guidance from the Oregon State Department of Education. Yes, yes. This is not just something I've dreamed up. No. This, this is, is something they are promoting. Right, exactly. And, uh, but, the fortunate thing is that with the schools shut and knowledge <laughs> of the educators being essentially pushing loony ideas, the more and more can parents see it. are realizing the parents can see it. Their parents are seeing it more and more. And the, the view that public schools are a danger to school to children is is becoming a common, not an uncommon view. And it's, it's, it, it's getting more and more traction. And this is just, you know, another example of, of uh, progressivism and woke ideology pushing itself to its logical conclusion. People saying, you gotta be, you got to be kidding me. So what did people think of Victor Davis Hanson's uh, column? Article? Yeah, that was pretty, pretty intense. Um, just uh, for your information, uh, if you want to see it, you can go to our website, independent.org. And at the top on the right, uh, we've got a link to it. It's called Hitting Woke Herd Immunity? Mm -hmm. uh, we, have, we have become an absurd society obsessed with race, but without any mechanism to develop a logical category of victimization and reparation. And in that piece, uh, Victor Davis Hanson argues <clears throat> that the immunities <clears throat> to the virus of wokeness may be starting to kick in. Yes. And we might eventually reach herd immunity as ordinary people <laughs> realize that th these, these inane discussions among pointy-headed intellectuals are starting to penetrate to yes. their kids' classroom. So maybe postmodernism is reaching its, its point of no return All right. because people are seeing what it means, which means, yeah. I mean, and of course, the quotes in that article and others from a lot of these proponents, uh, including the, the mass standards in Oregon, uh, you know, someone makes a claim that there is no thing, such thing as objectivity. Well, what about your statement? You're making a statement of objectivity. So hence- right. It's self-refuting. It's self-refuting, right. right. And so right. you have this incurrent viewpoint and the good, the good sign of it being pushed is that more and more people see it and they're not gonna put up with it. Yeah, exactly. And I, I was just thinking that, um, you know, one of the striking things about the piece, uh, and here's a here's a view of it from our website, uh, whose picture is featuring with Victor's piece. That looks a bit like Senator Joseph McCarthy. It is, because he talks about McCarthy in the piece. Yeah. And, and so, you know, just as McCarthy went too far and there was a big backlash, although he was right about some things, but even more, the woke crowd uh, may be going too far and triggering its own backlash. I mean, when, when our, okay, so I'll, I'll get down to something very ordinary to parents. Uh, when our girls were little, you know, we're teaching them their ABCs. One of the books we loved was Dr. Seuss's ABC. So big P, little P, what begins with P? Painting pink pajamas, policeman in a pail, Peter Pepper's puppy, and now Papa's in the pail. <laughs> and they loved Big P, Little P, and so forth. Uh, Dr. Seuss's uh, ABC, I think, is maybe escaping the cut, but a bunch of his other books are not. And now, of course, you've got to warn your children, well, now, I know the ABCs are a sweet book, but you know Dr. Seuss has other stuff which isn't so good. And so, you know, the, the company itself, his legacy company, is pulling several of the titles. 
I understand that books uh, on Amazon and eBay are being pulled now as well. Uh, Dr. Seuss is in the doghouse and people notice that kind so of thing. Now let me completely take a diversion, but on Dr. Seuss. Okay. So I actually have an, a completely different objection to Dr. Seuss. It has nothing to do with his racist cartoons, uh, especially against Japanese Americans during World War II. Some of them were pretty horrible. He, he realized that, and that's why the Sneetches and Horton Hears a Who and so forth are proponent, proponent toleration. But all of Hollywood was like that too, Bill. Of At course, the time. absolutely. And he, he published these cartoons in PM. Yep. which was a New York City leftist newspaper, right. the most leftist mass newspaper in America at the mm -hmm. time. Big proponents of Henry Waltz. No, I have a completely different interest. So the idea of Cat in the Hat is restricted vocabulary. Mm -hmm. Can you write a reasonably lengthy children's picture book, but with a foreshortened vocabulary? The idea is instead of having the kids learn attack skills, learning to do a phonics breakdown, you know, you're, you're always going to have, you're not going to have uh, anti-disestablishmentarianism in a book for very young children. But you can, if you teach them attack skills, they can break down words that they haven't seen before. But another, the other camp, the whole language camp, says, no, you're going to memorize the words as if they were Chinese ideographs, mm -hmm. okay? Right. So it's, and, and you use a psycholinguistic guessing game and you learn the shape of the word and, uh, you know, oh, this has a, a Y in it or a G, that's like a monkey's tail, just strange stuff like this, instead mm -hmm. of learning to sound out the words. Mm -hmm. So well, without saying he's like solely in that camp or something, he was falling into that idea mm -hmm. He was specifically doing this to have a restricted vocabulary book. And I think kids are capable of sounding out words. I mean, that's really how you do learn to read. And so this is something you don't hear in this debate, but I'm throwing yeah, it in. That's well, a new my angle. My mother was a teacher, and she had yeah. the same view, Bill. Great. And uh, my wife Mary's mother, who started two K-12 through schools, had the same view as well. But that's not what is being that's discussed. That's not what this controversy is about. We are wide ranging. <laughs> yeah, the, the controversy applies to a crusade yes. to try to find some rationale to discredit mainstream American culture. Yes, I agree. And so it's cartoons, it's, it's books, it's Shakespeare, it's, you know, it's, it's right. everything. Shakespeare is being, uh, the Library Journal just had an article Yep. on why people are getting Shakespeare out of libraries and out of the classroom. Yes. And Joseph Pierce had a quite an excellent little article. He's a Catholic theorist who probably goes way too far in claiming that Shakespeare was a Catholic through and through. But anyway, that's aside. He yep. points out, look, Shakespeare has all these strong female characters. Yep. He... The villain of Otello is not Otello, it's Iago. He's a white guy mm -hmm. <laughs> and so forth. Yes. So it's these people are, as you're saying, they're looking for something to throw things out. This is the people want to take down the statue of Adam Smith in Edinburgh. Right. This is another. Right. So there's Smith a guy who crusaded against slavery. Right. And they're trying to tag him as some kind of. Because he said slavery was everywhere, ubiquitous. Well, that's a reason why we have to take down his statue. It's still, there's still thousands of slaves out there in the, in the world. And, uh, you know, not probably right in my neighborhood, but they are out there in the world. There are a lot of slaves still. So we still have to be fighting against this. Anyway, you're right. I, I just, you mentioning parents and schooling, my mother, used to go as a volunteer in San Francisco public schools and they weren't teaching any phonics. And she had to smuggle phonics sheets in mm -hmm. that she got from Catholic schools mm -hmm. in order to teach the public school kids how to sound out words. Right. Now here's, um, she sounds like my kind of lady, but uh, he, here's an interesting comment from one of our participants on ThinkSpot It just sent in. Uh, he says, Disc discussing the cancellation of Dr. Seuss is a bit sensationalist. 
the company is deciding on its own to retire three of their books. They have done this before as well because the content may be considered offensive to their audience. That looks like greenwashing to me more than canceling. Now, I don't know what greenwashing is exactly, but I think I get the point of his objection. I mean, why should we be upset that some private company, whether it be the Dr. Seuss Legacy Company or Facebook or eBay or whatever, or Disney Plus, I mean, they're private companies. Shouldn't they be free to take stuff down off their website without being attacked? What we're complaining about is the hypocrisy of firms that make one claim and, and have all sorts of contradictions. For example, with eBay, they want to ban any, any seller, because there's hundreds of sellers who are trying to sell the different doc, these six Seuss books, but they have no problem with books by Farrakhan. They, they still sell Mein Kampf. I mean, oh, they're still selling it. What yeah. is the criteria? By the way, we scholars want to be able to buy books by Farrakhan That's right. or Adolf Hitler, because how can we study them if we can't get them? Right. right, but my point is they're claiming this is the standard, the woke standard is against racism, yeah. but it doesn't apply universally. It only applies when it's in their interest or fits the woke trend at the moment. And they're pushing this out of libraries and out right. of schools, and that's not just... Right. right. That's uh, not just private action. deciding it That's doesn't right. want. And, and somebody pointed out, I'm not necessarily buying this, the whole issue of intellectual property is a huge can of worms. Uh, but somebody said, well, the purpose of copyright is to encourage people to continue to write things. Mm -hmm. And if something falls out of print for a number of years and no use is being made of the copyright, what's the point of the copyright? Mm -hmm. So why shouldn't these things, this is this man's argument, which I don't necessarily buy, but I just throw out the point. If these guys are giving up on this book, hey, maybe it should become open season for printing that book. I'm not really for that, I don't think, but I'm just saying there is a supposed claim of uh, social utility in copyrights. I personally think it's more like I'm a, I create this, I give out people's rights to copy it, mm -hmm. and uh, I can hang on to that right to copy. Right. But, but going, there going is back this other to argument our... that people make. Go, go so ahead, if, David. If we get back to Victor Davis Hanson's article, right, and he's talking again about uh, this woke uh, ideology pandemic um, reaching herd immunity, and Again, if Dr. Seuss is the enemy, and if uh, Disney is the enemy, and if Shakespeare is the enemy, if English grammar if is the enemy, Frederick if Douglas mathematics is, is the, the enemy, if Frederick Douglass is the enemy, and if, if Adam Smith, who crusaded against slavery, is the enemy of racism, uh, it has no meaning. And so that's, I think that's the key that that Victor is trying to make the point is that people are, are seeing that this is uh, a power grab, a power grab, and it is incoherent, and it is a uh, sort of a, a, a current temporary pandemic, which out without any basis to it. And it's like you know, it's Markle, only going to be temporary if we push back. Right. It's like Markle on Oprah complaining that she's <laughs> oppressed. She's oppressed. She can never be heard. Hence, she's on Oprah, right? And so people see more and more of this kind of thing. Uh, the, polls in Brit the polls in Britain show, I think as of yesterday, that a, by a huge margin, the British public wants all the privileges removed from her right. and her husband now. So so I think that's what, what Victor is referring to, is that this narrative is false, and the more they push it, the faster do people see that. Let me just so. We have to keep speaking out to make sure that's right. known. Yep. For sure, that's one reason, I guess, why we're doing this today. I mean, going back to the specifics of our questioner, um, uh, while I'm not at all saying that those companies don't have a right to pull some stuff back if they want to, I am saying with David uh, a moment ago that they should be ashamed of violating their own principles of diversity right. and freedom. Yes. And moreover, um, uh, if one fixates simply on the private choice of some companies to pull back their products, 
and fails to see how the impulse behind that is connected to all these other things. It's not that they took a market survey and or took an inventory and found out these weren't selling. They right. turned to a panel of, of ideological experts and they advised them to withdraw those books. Yes, because the average person doesn't have agency to make their own choices. Mm -hmm, right. See, that's, the, that, that's where that's the ideology the, comes in. That's the posture, and yeah. Where these, these platforms are making claims of openness and opportunity, when it comes down to it, they're falling prey to the opposite. Right, so Dumbo is taught by the crows to fly, right. which so is a fabulous the, thing. The crows are very the, helpful and generous of them. But, but so that has to be canceled. The crow's doing something helpful <laughs> because the crows might be black. Well, okay, they're doing good things. The, <laughs> so yeah, to cancel them. If what the crow, idiots. If the crows are blacks, it's the crows that are the hero of the story. Exactly. Heroes of the stories. So exactly. what are you canceling exactly? You're canceling something that actually is You're teaching canceling someone our a lesson. brains. Right. <laughs> Basically. So these, these things are interconnected, uh, as we said, because the impulse behind them has to do with the reign of experts over people who don't know what to think properly. It's connected to the attempt to discredit English grammar, attempt to discredit math and objectivity in science and, and knowledge generally, um, the, the attempt to discredit the principles of the American founding. These things all flow together. And I'm just going to read you kind of as we come to a landing here, this interesting sentence from uh, Victor Davis Hanson's piece, which we mentioned before. He says, peak wokeness, peak wokeness is nearing. Also because if it continued in its present incarnation, then the United States, as we know, would cease to exist, as we know it would cease to exist in the sense that 1692 Salem or 1793 through 94 Paris could not have continued without destroying society. Woke leftism exists to destroy and tear down, not to unite and build. It is not designed to play down and heal rich racial differences, but to accentuate and capitalize on them. Brilliant summary, in my opinion. By the way, one little anecdote about Dumbo again, getting back to the crows. The head of the crows uh, is called Jim Crow. Okay, So the story is basically saying that blacks who were impressed oppressed by Jim Crow were the saviors of freedom and the life of Dumbo. The oppressors were the other elephants of the same species of Dumbo. Mm -hmm. Who made fun of him. So it seems to be, if anything is woke, that should be it. They're making fun of Jim Crow is the point. Mm -hmm. Yeah, these people, that they're just kind of like grim culture commissars who right. can't understand subtlety and can't even see wryness, whether visually or in print. They're right. almost it's like blind. Bad. It's like, it's like uh, wanting to change the name of Robert Lewis and Stevenson School in San Francisco. It's the same inane, uh, desperate because attempt. They, because they didn't understand his poem about foreign children. They exactly. got it completely backward. Right. right. Exactly. They, have, right. they have the exact opposite of what his in, in plan and intention and message was. Well, Victor, Victor also, uh, one of his uh, examples he makes is the Soviet uh, army forcing tank divisions to go off on wild, ideologically, um, ideologically approved missions that had nothing to do with tactics and strategy and having lots of people killed. And of course, the Soviets were known for their, you know, Lysenkoism and all these other nonsensical right. things. Uh, and not to say that we don't have kind of uh, sci science alarmist things here, we do. But to support it uh, by a private company is simply uh, foolish. We need broad learning. We need s subtle, nuanced minds everywhere. We need all sorts of points of view bouncing off one another. We need people interacting freely on the basis of their own choices. Um, in that kind of environment, there's real accountability and real progress possible. Let's not close things down. Uh, that's how I would summarize it. Well, okay. So, David Thoreau, thank you so much. Uh, thank Bill you. Evers, it's a pleasure to have your insights. I really thank you value that so much. Thank you to our friends on ThinkSpot who made this possible. Also to all the people who joined us for the conversation today. I'm sorry I couldn't get to all your questions, but I got to a number of them. 
And uh, we covered some of them in the course of our conversation, actually. So thanks for joining us. Um, I invite you all, when you need resources, both in matters of concrete stuff like economics or more subtle things like culture and society, uh, turn to the Independent Institute. Our website, independent.org, has a lot of resources which we are refreshing daily uh, for your use and edification and real pleasure too. Uh, and uh, we thank you all for joining us. Please join us again for the Independent Outlook. Take care. Thank you.